Sorry's unqualified opinions. I'm Ryan Selkis at Two Bit Idiots, and we're back after a brief hiatus um, from uh, from from doing this podcast, given Blockchain Week and and a few different initiatives that we've been pursuing on our end. But we wanted to kick things back off with a bang uh, with our guest today, Ryan Zur, who's the Chief Commercial Officer at the Web3 Foundation. Uh, Ryan's been around uh, the industry for a while. I was formerly at Polychain. Uh, and has now taken his talents to the decentralized web and, and uh, working on both polka dots. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Edgeware and, um, and then, of course, the Web3 Foundation and, and some of their initiatives that they've got cooking this summer and, and uh, just generally speaking towards the uh, latter half of this year when hopefully we're, we're going to expect a, a mainnet uh, to, to progressively launch. So um, without further ado, uh, Ryan, uh, wanted to start off by just uh, kind of hearing, you know, your path to Web3. Um, obviously, you'd gotten to know those guys previously as an investor. Um, what made you make the leap and, and maybe give a little bit of, of background on the pro- not just the project, which I think folks might know at a high level, but where you are in the evolution of, of the Polkadot project and, and what to expect as we, uh, as we work towards a mainnet launch and, and you delivering on, on some of the promises from the 2017 and, and 2018 uh, formation. Cool. Uh, well, thanks very much uh, for having me on, Ryan. And um, I also just want to start by highlighting and, and thanking uh, the amazing work that you do in the space. Um, the, the work that Masari does uh, in delivery on a rainy day on the sidewalk in New York when this was just an idea and I'm um, thinking that, you know, it was a pretty good idea, but uh, seeing you deliver on it um, has been amazing. And so our entire industry is grateful to the work or for the work that you do. Um, but so switching over to uh, kind of Web3 and, um, and, and, and Polkadot, what got me really excited about this project um, were a couple of different um, innovations with respect to Polkadot specifically that that um, I I feel like are needed in this moment in the industry and are a big step forward for our industry and, and thusly really, really exciting. Um, I've been hanging around the project since uh, the very early days. Um, was lucky enough to see uh, one of the early Polkadot papers and uh, and then um, was working with the team on on kind of structuring the the Zug st- stip tongue and, and and getting ready for the crowd sale in in 2017 and working pretty closely um, with Utah and and Bjorn and um, and everybody over there. I uh, really like the team. Um, get along really well with, uh, with the group. It's just a a, a really solid group of technologists and um, they believe in what they're doing, believe in the ethos of Web3, uh, which is, is probably the most important thing. Um, uh, and and so when I exited Polychain, this was really the obvious choice for me. Um, I was already uh, a board member and sitting on the board there um, and very active in the project. And, and then um, as this is sort of uh, the blockchain 3.0 is the, the kind of next evolution of uh, of projects this will be the first really big technical leap from an innovation standpoint to go live mm-hmm. I'm optimistic that um, we can get this live by the end of the year however with the caveat that this is very very vanguard technology and um, you know security audits may push things back uh, our industry is notorious for a delaying um, on 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 shipping and deadlines and things like that, so uh, we'll see uh, we'll see how that goes. But certainly, kind of around the end of the year, maybe into the start of next year, um, we're optimistic that we'll see a live polka dot, and we're optimistic that that will um, create some very interesting novel use cases uh, for our, for our industry. And so, the things that are like special about polka dot, what's like. What are these aha moments where when you dive into it, you're like, wait a second, like this is actually pretty big. Um, for me, it's four things. The first is arbitrary cross-chain messaging. So you can send smart uh, smart con- or calls from one smart contract to another smart contract on a totally different chain. So say a Tezos smart contract could call a 
uh, Ethereum smart contract or an Ethereum smart contract could send a message to a Definity smart contract. Um, that is a much broader scope than just merely token transfer or value transfer across chain. Mm -hmm. Value transfer across chain is a really important use case and, and I expect there to be a number of, of um, sort of attempts and innovations around solving that issue. But the wider scope of arbitrary cross-chain messaging, I think, will, will open up um, a lot of novel applications and, and use cases, and that's that's really powerful. The second thing um, is pooled security. And so with Polkadot, parachains can connect into Polkadot and then sort of offload their security to the relay chain. Um, and so what this means is instead of inflating their own token to pay for a, a bootstrap decentralized group of, of miners or validators on that chain, they can unload it to the relay chain and achieve massive resource efficiency. Um, so today to run a layer one chain costs usually somewhere in the millions of dollars um, uh, in inflation of your own token. In the case of Ethereum, it's actually hundreds of millions a year. And in the case of Bitcoin, it's actually billions a year or per year. And, um, and with Polkadot, by sharing uh, the validator set, we can pool resources and drop the cost of security by an order of magnitude. Um, so I've done some back of the napkin calculations where I kind of backed into somewhere in the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year rather than um, the millions of dollars a year. That's really important as we move forward to a more competitive landscape in the industry where um, you know chains won't be able to translate this cost of security of millions per year into say transaction fees or something else to continue to pay this. As we look for sustainable solutions, um, the cost of securing the network is going to matter. And, uh, and I think this is probably the best attempt that I've seen at, um, at, at taking the cost of security really, um, really seriously. Um, so then from there, the third thing, which is, I thought was really special, uh, was Gavin and his team had spun up uh, Substrate, and, which is a framework that allows you uh, to very quickly and easily build um, smart contracts and then potentially deploy them as a parachain using another tool called Cumulus. And this was a trend that I was seeing, th this idea of kind of application specific chains where a chain exists for a, a, a very unique, very specific application, say like a Binance chain or an Aragon chain or all these other projects that are seeing scalability issues in where they're working and and want to ha want to kind of own their design space from the ground up for their users and their use case. Um, so we're seeing very mature teams. A lot of these groups in this mass exodus of 2017 and 2018 who left Google and left Facebook to work in in the space, and they were saying, no, 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 no. I don't want to be subordinate to the consensus mechanism and security model of some other chain. I want to make that design decision for myself, given the users and use case that I have. And so Polkadot enables this, uh, this creation of, of application specific chains that then can communicate with other chains um, around the world. And I think that's incredibly powerful and in a very obvious trend that I'm seeing among the most sophisticated teams in the space. Um, from say from an investor's perspective uh, and then the fourth thing which is really compelling but I won't dive into the the minutia in this in the context of this conversation is um, the governance model so it's a very you know, unique uh, and what I would say is an elegant governance model that has different security parameters that aggregate the lessons learned from crypto governance that we've had along the way so mm -hmm. things like uh, achieving minimum quorum and um, and ensuring that the, the system can make decisions and evolve uh, and, and not get sort of stuck in endless debate around uh, a specific issue. And so those are kind of the four things where I was like, wait, this is really interesting. The fourth um, is a particular interest of mine, a particular personal interest of mine with crypto governance. 
and I think it's it's a really fun, interesting space that we're just scratching the surface of. Um, and so that's why I decided to focus most of my time on, on Polkadot these days. Well, pretty comprehensive starting point. I think we're going to want to drill into a few different facets of that. So, you know, I, I think you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about some of the uh, debates online uh, that, that yeah. particularly on crypto Twitter uh, spilled over in, into the, uh, in some cases, the absurd. But um, you and, and some of your colleagues That's have, have <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so, some some of the uh, conversations uh, you know may or may not have have merit. But I think you know one of the um, a couple of the root causes that uh, lead to some of this friction. On the one hand, there is the fact that a large chunk of the initial polka dot sale. Uh, is essentially frozen due to the, the parity bug that essentially suicided that wallet and, and along with it tens of millions of dollars um, of, uh, of, of, of the Ethereum that was raised in, in that initial sale. Um, along with that, you've got uh, the feeling from many within the Ethereum community that it's time to you know kind of put our, on our big boy pants and, and realize that not every single protocol um, that is out in the wild is intended to, to play nicely uh, with the Ethereum ecosystem, in many cases, um, competing interoperability protocols like Polkadot, maybe like Cosmos, presents um, at least some type of threat to, to Ethereum's dominance. So, so I, I wonder if you could unpack a little bit how the Web3 Foundation navigates that fine line between collaboration, because these are open protocols, um, and competition because you genuinely believe that there's you know, potentially going to be an order of magnitude cost savings on the security spend to build on a parachain versus the Ethereum main chain through, through something like an ERC-20. Because there are definitely trade-offs, um, and I think you know, we, we generally align around the fact that there may be this interoperable future where um, all of these blockchains talk to each other and, and, and kind of make their own distinct trade-offs when it comes to um, pooled security versus uh, full autonomy over, over the governance of the system. Um, and the truth probably lies somewhere in between on the Ethereum versus Cosmos versus Polkadot versus you know, other smart contract platform uh, debate. I'm, I'm curious how you unpack that and, and, and generally speaking, how you work towards interoperability without, um, without causing as much friction um, with, uh, with some of the existing you know, incumbent developers, or if that even matters, right? Because uh, I, I think competition is a dirty word in this industry, but I'm not convinced that, that you know, the end result of competition isn't healthier for the entire ecosystem. Um, what, what, what is you know, both the marketing line and then you know, in, in reality, how you'd approach projects and, and, and you know, consider working together um, with someone like the you know, Ethereum Foundation or, or you know, some of their representatives? Yeah. Um, so I'd say, you know, there's a lot more synergies uh, between what we're doing and, and, and say what the Ethereum Foundation is, is doing and, and what our community is doing and what the Ethereum community is doing than there is direct competition. Um, uh, you know, Polkadot itself is not a smart contract platform um, and it would be perfectly logical for someone who wants to deploy a smart contract to do that in um, uh, in Ethereum, uh, and and then connect to other chains via via Polkadot? Um, there there certainly exists. You know, if you take it the furthest point down the slippery slope possible, um, there exists, I guess, a, a sense of competition in 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 the idea that if somebody owns token X, then that is opportunity cost of, of not owning token Y, or if somebody is working on an application in, in say, X ecosystem, then they're probably not spending that, that valuable time in Y ecosystem. Um, but at the same time, you know, especially when it comes to, to developer mindshare, I would say trying new things and experimentation should trump, uh, like, the focus of one area. I think we're far too early in this space to declare that you know the right path is this and 
and there are no alternative experiments that need to be conducted and we need to all be focused in a kind of maximalist um, sense towards one uh, towards one ecosystem to make that the one chain to rule them all. Um, I, I think it, what I resonated a lot with Web3 and the ethos of, of Web3 is that we want safe spaces for experimentation, right? Um, and, and the parachain model sort of allows that, right? We can have a really cool experiment, say like Edgeware, um, where we try a novel distribution mechanism like the drop, the lock drop, and that that could blow up, and that could and it could need to be reverted, and we don't know how that experiment's going to play itself out. Um, but we can't run that on a multi-billion-dollar chain, right? Like it's just not, it, it wouldn't be re responsible. And so, um, I I think myself and a lot of my contemporaries come at this from um, an experimentation first perspective and and trying new things uh, is uh, it, it, it is warranted and, and necessary in the context of, of our current um, stage of, of evolution and then from there um, uh, it, it, you know there's also a lot of direct um, overlap that we that we see um, so for example uh, the Web3 Foundation is a founding member of, of the ECF. Um, we are uh, constantly in conversation with uh, different components of the Ethereum uh, ecosystem about co-funded initiatives around um, certain research topics. And um, so, for example, there was a big WASM jam in Berlin uh, this past weekend, which I know a lot of Ethereum people were at, a lot of Web3 people were at. Uh, and during those the, those conferences and and and, and uh, working groups, the the spirit of that uh, conversation is never really around competition. Like when I talk about like when I talk to the leaders of of these ecosystems, nobody's worried about competition in this in this instance. We're we're more worried about um, you know will will these new innovations work right? Will will this like will we be able to roll this out in an appropriate <laughs> Um, amount of time can we get capture users that's the big this is the big thing that we're talking about now is is you know how do you get people to actually use this stuff I um, mean less about like ah you know if our chain isn't the one chain to rule them all and doesn't have the monetary premium then that's that's bad for me so I'm gonna sabotage you like well, well I, I, I also wonder if in addition to application specific chains um, you have almost sector specific uh, meta protocols. So, you know, right now, w one open question for me is why Ethereum would be the right protocol to build a Web3 application, um, you know, data driven application or high throughput application um, on versus uh, an entirely different um, set of protocols where Ethereum has proven to be very effective as a capital raising platform. Uh, as a facilitator of all types of decentralized financial applications. Um, so whether you're talking about lending products, derivatives, you know, other you know, types of, of you know, pooled risk products, prediction markets, um, there's a lot there already that leverages Ether as you know, commodity money and programmable money that, that seems yep. to be, uh, quite frankly, you know, pretty sufficient. Um, even if that was it, right? I mean, this intermediating, uh, disintermediating most of finance um, and having like the settlement layer of, of, of di digital finance run on, on your blockchain seems like a pretty good outcome. Um, you have the ability to pool security for, I believe, 100 parachains to start, right? Is that a dynamic parameter or is that pretty no, set so far? It, it certainly is dynamic. Okay. It will start out as very few parachains at the point of, of network launch call it you know just for the for the sake of order of magnitude we don't know exactly how many but call it for the sake of order of magnitude like half a dozen or, or maybe even fewer okay but just a, but but but, but I, I yeah so we, we can get into the scalability and kind of where you go but um but the but i guess the gist is those half dozen or dozen applications or, or some of the early applications i think are going to look fundamentally different than some of the top applications on ethereum right now that are more focused on the DeFi elements of the industry Correct. Yeah, uh, it, it could very well be. Um, uh, you know, it, it it it's totally plausible 
that the way that the future looks is that kind of DeFi and programming money um, is, is the domain of Ethereum, and that's great. And then we see other chains pop up for, um, for other use cases, say, um, you know, like messaging uh, or, 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 or like applications that, that require just, you know, wicked high transaction throughput. Um, or very low cost of transactions. So for example, like, you know, paying the cost of gas to send effectively a text message on a messaging platform on, on Ethereum may not be, that may not be cost effective. Mm -hmm. But if that text message has, you know, a $500 loan attached to it, maybe that is cost effective with gas. And, uh, well, certainly is. Um, it, it, and so, you know, I, I, I try to myself remain very open-minded to the possibilities of how these things fit together um, to understand that there will be some kind of fitting together here. Like something will probably emerge that Ethereum does really, really well and that's awesome. And right now it looks like this DeFi programmable money, but maybe it evolves. Um, there may be some other things that emerge where people are, are really um, excited about the application specific chain. So for example, like um, DEXs, that looks like that could maybe go the direction of, uh, of application specific chains to just solve some of those issues like like front running and so on and so forth. Um, and, right, right, and it, right, right now it looks just as likely that maybe some of those DEXs would, would move over to something like Cosmos. Um, you know, Binance right. in particular because they desire more control and, and, and some right degree of autonomy over the, the validators and, and, and the consensus mechanism versus yep. delegating it to someone like, you know, uh, Polkadot. It, it, it's kind of, um, uh, it, it speaks to the larger trade-off that teams have to make um, if they're actually securing high value transactions, at least early returns are, they would want to use a chain like Ethereum or a interoperability solution like Cosmos where they still have that degree of autonomy. I guess you know the question is you know uh, unpack um, kind of the profile and, and kind of target for who would be some of the initial parachain application uh, providers. Maybe we could start since you brought them up with with Edgeware um, and 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 you know what the initial um, cohort will look like that's that's building on your parachains. Yeah. So the initial set of parachains, if I, if I could have a wish list. Um, I think obviously, so there's a, a smart contract chain like Edgeware, which then ties in natively as a parachain to the Polkadot relay chain for the best performance possible. So Edgeware allows you to very easily deploy a, um, uh, a, a smart contract that you build using the substrate framework uh, and, and then run that on top of, uh, of, of Polkadot effectively. Um, and that's, that's cool and, and, and very interesting, and we'll see we'll see where that goes. And and certainly it has uh, a, a, um, in, in some interesting governance components to it. Uh, however, other sort of wish list items that I think I would have is I'd like to see a cross chain dex that maybe runs as its own pair chain. Um, I'd probably like to see some version of a bank. Um, that that is able to to create loans or create um, sub currencies that, that you, I've been playing around with this concept a lot with different people of the idea of a stabler coin like maybe not a stable coin but a stabler coin that's mm -hmm. like backed by a basket of assets or backed by some some stability mechanisms that don't guarantee that like one to one peg to like the SDR <laughs> the USD but get but do deliver some kind of uh, lower band of, of volatility than, than just from holding traditional crypto assets. There's some things like that. I think you'll see um, uh, some, some unique uh, uh, attempts at novel uh, consensus mechanisms, so like a novel DAG, um, like Blink, and then with that DAG, you can do really fast transactions. So then say like, that messaging app or a very high frequency trading app becomes possible again. Um, and then the other thing that we'll see, and I think this is probably the most important thing, 
is that we'll see bridges to legacy chains. So you'll see Ethereum have have a, a bridge, um, and and then we, and then that the great thing is we can unload like what Ethereum does great. It should continue to do great, and then and then Polkadot doesn't need to try to like recreate that. Um, or, or within the Polkadot ecosystem, we don't need to try to recreate that. Uh, we can we can tie into Ethereum and then and then hopefully uh, uh, use that. One interesting component that we should recognize when we think about um, say application specific chains or cross chain um, interactions like transfer of value and things like that is a concept that I call economic scalability constraints. So if we have um, two endpoints, uh, and those two endpoints are trying to transfer some amount of value, and then through those two endpoints you have some some like link. The the amount of escrow effectively that that link um, carries is the maximum amount of value that can be transferred over uh, a period of time between these two endpoints. So if um, you know if we've got two 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 zones, or, or like let's say connected on on Bitcoin Lightning or uh, state channels or any of these layer two solutions, um, and you've got an escrow that's posted of of say a million dollars. Well, you can't send a hundred million dollars in, in a short period of time through that um, through that point, whether it's that state channel or that Lightning um, node or or whatever it is, right? And so you're limited by the escrow and then that escrow has to be remunerated so these layer two solutions are not zero cost right every time we layer something on we're going to add cost and friction and this is something that i that i find compelling about the architecture of the relay chain is because all the value is that is consolidated on the relay chain and the messages are being passed through that relay chain the the the, the sort of scalability constraint from an economic perspective is just the overall value of the entire relay chain. So if the relay chain's worth, say, you know, $500 million, it's totally fine to be able to pass, say, that $100 million through those two endpoints. And so um, I, I do think that as we evaluate some of these, these layer two solutions, we're going to have to start to, to think about remuneration of this escrow, how much that costs, and then translate that into, okay, the fact that these layer twos do have um, uh, an actual cost to them. And again, what this translates back to is we're super early. We need to try, you know, dozens of different experiments and see what works. And we need to all remain a pretty open-minded in this early juncture as as a community, just working towards um, you know the common goal of this stuff working and people using it. In in practice, how portable do you think some of these application-specific chains will be if they start on Ethereum or Cosmos and and decide, you know what, we don't actually need to bootstrap our own security, so it doesn't make sense to to use our own uh, zone and and the Cosmos hub and zone model. We're gonna uh, instead just work with the Polkadot pair chains. We'll pay the the, the validator fees um, to actually uh, join that network, um, and vice versa, right? Because I, I can imagine that application specific chains, their the value that they secure is going to ebb and flow. The cumulative cost uh, to to running on one of these different protocols uh, is going to ebb and flow. And then you've also got technical risk that um, that developers are going to worry about with the coming migration from ETH to ETH 2.0, which is basically an entirely different blockchain, new blockchain. Um, the fact that it's um, still very early uh, and, and you haven't launched yet. Cosmos is in kind of its very like earliest formation and, and, and foundational stages. Uh, plus, there are all these other um, new blockchains that are coming out and, and, and getting spun up over the course of the, the next couple of quarters that will hit the wild, I think, you know, probably, you know, later this year, early 2020. Um, yeah. Switching costs, um, in theory, should go way down um, if, if these solutions work as advertised. Uh, so in, in that model, um, where does the stickiness come from and, and you know, how do you either pull share or, or kind of lock in value um, or, or, or do you not really think like that because you think it's going to be more of a natural ebb and flow, at least in the early stages? Yeah, 
um, you touch on a really interesting point that I confess I have uh, flip-flopped uh, over a period of time. Um, so I started out with the idea that, you know, the best tech should probably win out and the easiest sort of developing uh, environment or developing experience should be where um, devs migrate to. Uh, and then number three, devs will also migrate to where they have compelling rewards. Um, however, I think we've seen, I, I confess I've been surprised to see uh, how sticky um, devs have been to Ethereum and, and building with Solidity. Um, you know, for the, for the amount that, that, that people complain about um, that, like that development experience, it's still like by far and away um, the most used and will probably continue to be so. So we, we observe that devs are actually quite sticky once they um, learn a, a, a given environment or a given uh, ecosystem. And, um, and so it, it's difficult to, difficult to predict in this moment, uh, you know, how things will ebb and flow and where migration patterns will, will lead uh, over time. Um, it, and in the context of like, you know, probably somewhere around 20 layer ones will pop up in the next 12 months that offer, you know, in, in their mind, some compelling <laughs> uh, innovation beyond Ethereum, either, you know, performance with a transaction per second or some form of scalability or some form of usability or, or so on and so forth. Um, however, given the stickiness that we observe in the space right now, uh, you know, one would think that uh, Ethereum for smart contract deployment will continue to to lead for the foreseeable future. That it won't be this like mass migration, and then everybody just like quickly shifts over to uh, to to this new thing that's popped up. You know, those of us like like yourself and um, and and others who have been around Ethereum for since day one. You know, there was a long period of time where there wasn't really a lot of activity happening before it started to kind of slowly accumulate. And now we're moving into this era where 20 other players are trying to do this same thing, slowly build up a developer ecosystem and tools and apps and, and, and development frameworks and IDEs and so on and so forth. And that takes a long time to do. That takes years to do. Um, and during those period of years, that, that gives Ethereum a lot of leeway to, you know, evolve and adjust and, and take lessons learned um, if, uh, if the Ethereum community is sort of motivated and well organized enough to aggregate lessons learned and then execute on them very quickly. And that's an important thing. Um, it's one thing to have the lead. It's another thing to be agile enough to maintain the lead. Right. Well, uh, let, let's let's wrap up by um, asking what you know basically anybody cares about, which is when are we going to actually see this stuff in the wild? Uh, so, so walk through the next few months. You've got the Web three summit coming up during yep. Berlin Blockchain Week in August. Um, you said hopefully by the end of the year we'll, we'll we'll see the full rollout. What are the key milestones and what's next um, on the roadmap for for actually bringing um, Polkadot and 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 some of your early projects to markets uh, and and actually. Uh, out in the wild, uh, where this becomes more than just a theoretical. So you'll see some announcements in the coming weeks around some exciting sort of early um, ways to 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 build and and sort of uh, get your hands dirty with Polkadot. Um, it, it, again, I'm an optimist, and I would like to think that by the end of the year we can hopefully get a. a you know, a V1 Genesis moment uh, out the door. Uh, let's see how, how that goes. In order to get there, the dependencies of this project are, you know, primarily going through security audits. So we're mo moving into the security audit phase at this point. Um, we're in the Alexander test now. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll move on to, uh, to the mainnet um, relatively shortly. But it depends on 
the security audits, which are a, um, you know, a, a big unknown. Like, well, I've been through security audit processes with a lot of different projects um, in the Ethereum space, and typically they take, uh, you know, kind of three to six months, uh, but they can take a lot longer. We've seen full rewrites. We've seen full, like, massive um, refactorings of code bases that have have needed to be done, um, giving or because of these security audits. So it's a bit of an unknown um, right now. But I am uh, very um, so lots of data points uh, from that. Um, two, this is being led by an extraordinarily talented team uh, that has a track record of delivering um, kind of on time and on budget. Uh, so so you know very grateful to have the parity team. Um, working on this project for, for the time being. And, and uh, I, I can't think of a, um, a team that's better equipped to kind of deliver this in an appropriate time frame. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, you know, it, generally I think we're, we're really excited. You can already um, very soon, say at the end of the summer, um, be able to deploy smart contracts onto Edgeware um, and, and then play around with that. And then, as I said, we'll have a, a really cool announcement in um, the coming weeks, or maybe up to a month, about an early, let's say, an early version of Polkadot that will allow people to um, really get involved and, and kind of understand this this network. And then um, we move through security audits, which we're entering now, and hopefully by the end of the year, um, we're ready to ready to you know. Um, put this bird in the air. Excellent. Well, I think uh, we're looking forward to seeing more of these experiments. Like you said, there's there's probably 20 different uh, interesting projects uh, that are going to be coming out in the next few quarters. Uh, some of them are going to be catastrophic failures. Uh, others are, are, are going to be uh, pretty um, revolutionary in terms of the, the new functionality that they, they bring to, uh, uh, to all types of new markets. So uh, yeah. time will tell uh, which direction. Yeah. Uh, you, you guys said, but uh, but I, I think based on the team, uh, we, we should have high hopes. Yeah. The only thing that we know is that um, just like the last, you know, eight, 10 years in this space, the next 24 months is going to be incredibly exciting with some uh, amazing innovations and probably some very spectacular blow ups. And that's, you know, that's crypto. That's what we love about crypto. That's why we're here. Um, and uh, you know, it's why we most of us remain very open-minded to to a, a whole plethora of possibilities for the future to unfold. Amen. Well, uh, appreciate the conversation and you taking the time. I also appreciate the nice things that you said at the onset. Um, so we look forward to to getting uh, your project on our registry in in relatively short order. Um, but uh, yeah. in uh, in the meantime, uh, people can check out the Web three Summit, which is coming up end of August. Uh, and of course, play around with the test net. Where are the resources? And, and, and we'll throw this in the show notes as well. But uh, yep. where should folks go to, to get involved and start playing around with the SDK? Um, so Polkadot, or so wiki.polkadot.network um, mm -hmm. is the best consolidation of, of uh, resources to get started, whether you want to uh, you know, build smart contracts using Substrate or run a validator node on the Alexander test net or the Edgeware test net. Or, um, or if you just want to learn more about Pol Polkadot's architecture or Polkadot's um, governance mechanism or, or, or anything like that. And then the last thing, I guess I would uh, stick in a shameless plug for, um, for the Web3 Summit, uh, uh, August 19th to the 21st uh, in Berlin. Um, we are very excited to have um, the likes of Edward Snowden and... Um, uh, many other sort of leaders of web privacy and um, it, it, it just the Web3 ethos. And so it, it will be very different than, say, a, a blockchain conference or, or, or a crypto conference. Um, it really brings together a lot of leaders from, from Web3 and web privacy as, along with some crypto projects. And you can kind of do your own thing so people can you know, create their own workspace and, and give presentations and, and it's sort of a, um, a built by and for uh, builders in this space. So uh, it was a great event last year and we're really excited about the possibility this year. 
Excellent. Well, we're looking forward to it as well. Uh, Ryan Zur from Web3 Foundation and Polka Dots. Uh, Ryan, thanks for joining, and uh, we'll catch up soon. For everybody thanks, else, uh, we will do this again with another episode coming up on Thursday with the founder of Crypto.com. You're not going to want to miss that one. Uh, and we're going to do a better job of giving people some advance notice on this uh, so it's easier to, to tune in for the live stream in addition to just downloading on Spotify, iTunes, and anywhere that you consume your podcasts for crypto, and since there's now 600 of them or so. Um, but we appreciate you stopping by for this one uh, and, uh, and, this, and hope folks, folks enjoy incredible. the conversation. Um, right. All right. Until next time. Peace. Cool. Thanks very much. Cheers.